Hello, everyone, and welcome to the visiting lecture series for spring 2021. This is the last lecture in the series. I want to encourage you to visit the Art and Art History website for more information about this program and other past and upcoming presentations. This presentation will include the artist talk followed by a short Q&A moderated by me. Once the presentation is finished, please type your questions in the chat box to the right of the video in YouTube. My name is A. Grix. I'm an MFA student in the ceramics department. Today, I have the opportunity to introduce tonight's artist, Robert Pruitt. Pruitt uses sculpture, animation, and photography to render the black body as a central figure in his work. Pruitt's drawings use influences from science fiction and hip hop to connect black experiences in the diaspora. He uses the work to create a sense of commonality and humanity that he finds lacking in many forms of black representation. He is a founding member of the Houston Artist Collective, Otobanga Jones and Associates. Pruitt currently resides in New York and was born in Houston, Texas. He received his BA from Texas Southern University in 2000, attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 2002, and received a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Texas at Austin in 2003. Some of Pruitt's notable exhibitions include his participation in the 2006 Whitney Biennial and other solo exhibitions of Pruitt have taken place at the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, Texas, the McKinney Art Center in Dallas, Texas, the Studio Museum in Harlem, New York, the Bakersfield Museum of Art in Bakersfield, California, a solo exhibition at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, California, and most recently his show at Salon 94. Pruitt has been awarded the Artadia Artist Award, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, and the Joan Mitchell Foundation Award. Pruitt was also awarded residencies at the Bema Center for Contemporary Art and the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. His work is collected nationally and internationally, including collections by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, and the U.S. giving a warm virtual welcome to Robert Good. <laughs> Everybody's clapping. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, she said, like A said, I'm Robert Pruitt. Um, I'm going to talk to you all about my work and what I do. And I guess I'm the last lecture for y'all. Uh, I'll try to make it interesting, worth your while, worth your time. And um, I'm going to, my, my screen is shared. I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint and we will just get right into it. Um, thank you all for having me. I, you know, appreciate being invited and, and doing these sorts of things that um, it's nice to be able to share the work that you make and kind of, um, you know, it, it's a moment to kind of reflect and give some language and some time to your practice, which is normally like just activity. Like, you know, you're doing this thing and thinking about it, but you don't always have an opportunity to kind of sit and contemplate and like, voice that to uh, anybody. So it's nice to have these opportunities to do that. So I appreciate being invited. Um, I have some stuff written just so I don't get off track. I will try not to uh, lean too much into like the written text, but I will we'll do enough to kind of keep me on task and moving forward. Uh, so you might sense a little bit of like um, up and down and how I present this thing. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna get started. Today, I'm gonna talk to you about my work about what I do. I, uh, like I mentioned, I make sculpture, animation, all kinds of stuff, but primarily I make large scale figurative drawings. Um, and I've been doing this since I was an undergrad. Uh, I've played around with a bunch of stuff, but always come back to drawing, which has always been my first love. Um, and so on the screen here is a drawing called Conjure Woman, which I think is an example of what I do. I, I have people come by the studio and I photograph them and then I, add things um, when I when I start making the drawing. I add all kinds of uh, objects and adornments and, you know, materials and like historical references to kind of um, draw out meaning that I can kind of place within, for me, like a, a, like a sense of like how we can start to think about the Black experience in America and the 
the breadth of it, right? Like the the scale of it, uh, which I think is not always um, understood in an intuitive way. And so I, I, for me, I'm just hoping that I can pull in so many things that for me speak to certain kinds of experiences that it would like, you know, expand this, this notion of identity. Um, okay. As I mentioned, my art practice is centered on drawing. I fell in love with drawing at a very young age. Um, I read comics as a kid and never lost that love. And I just spent a lot of time making drawings. I like drawing because it sort of, um, it's, it's, very, it's a thing that's like very much in my control in a way, uh, in a way I think that I never really had that relationship to painting. Um, I got my MFA in painting, but I am not like an expert at painting by any means. Um, I think my relationship to drawing was in some ways in opposition to the world of painting, like uh, wanting to work without um, the history of painting as part of like the image making that I was doing, um, or at least it can be a part of the, it can be a part of my work when I wanted to. It, like it's not necessarily immediately kind of read in that way. And so it, hopefully it allows me to kind of reach into other areas and, and bring ideas kind of to the fore, but also drawing, I think, because of it's like, and I'm showing like drawings that here, drawings that really kind of give you a sense of how they were made. Like you can see the line work, you can see the movement. And for me, that's one of the things that like, I enjoy it most about looking at drawings, even, you know, reading comics as a kid, like looking at how the artists like made things. Um, and I think that's kind of the magic of drawing that, and I I, I think about this often. And, and when I speak about my work, I try to relate this, like the fact that like how the thing is made is visible, like, you know, both it's making and it's wholeness is visible to the audience, like almost immediately. Um, and so I don't think I'll ever move too far outside of that. Um, yeah. So I do want to mention, like, sometimes my work is kind of connected to this notion of Afrofuturism. Um, I don't know if I, like, I discovered Afrofuturism through this kind of projection of it, like, in into the work. I was not necessarily fully aware of, like, the term and the history of it when people first started mentioning it around, mentioning that like, you know, my work kind of falls within some of that, but as I kind of like, you know, did a little bit of reading and experienced it. And we can really see a lot of that stuff kind of, even in like our media culture, you see Afrofuturism as like a, a mainstay at this point. Um, but I think for me, not I never had like a clear definition for it. and. Uh, a couple of years ago, I came across Ingrid LaFleur's definition of Afrofuturism, and I really like it. And I think it, you know, can underpin a lot of the stuff that I do in my work. So I do want to kind of uh, maybe place that here to think about as we go forward through the rest of this this talk. I'm going to I'm going to read this part. I mean, I know it's on the screen, but I'm going to read it. Um, Afrofuturism is a way of discussing the Black experience using speculative modalities like fantasy, horror and magical realism. Afrofuturists tend to look at these invisible histories from the diaspora, mythologies and legends sp and spiritual practices to help reorient our present through recontextualizing our past. And then hopefully we're able to imagine these futures where black bodies are empowered and have control over their destiny. Um, and I really I really like that definition. I think it kind of lays out the, the usefulness of Afrofuturism. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, like with the sort of surge of like artists and writers and particularly like television and film really leaning into like threads of Afrofuturism, you can see in real time, like black people starting to kind of conceive of themselves like outside of these like projected identities or beyond these concepts that like other people have conceived for us. Um, and I, I think that's amazing. I do want to say, I don't know, I'm in my studio right now. I'm not sure if you all can hear the noise outside. I think there's some kind of party or something happening. Maybe you can't hear it, but if you can, that's what's happening. I'm in the Bronx and 
I'm in a warehouse district. I don't know why there's like so much noise, but I'll keep going. Um, yeah, so as I talk today, think about Afrofuturism as like an underpinning of, of a lot of the stuff, you know, projects and, and images and things that I'm gonna show you, all right? Um, I'll talk a little bit about how I sort of, I'll say code the work or, you know, it's not a code, it's not like undecipherable. It's pretty, oftentimes it's pretty, you know, easy to kind of get some of the references. Um, but for me, it's just the, obviously it's juxtaposition. It's like pointing towards um, histories and, and other artists and just culture. And I do that through uh, adornment, through dress adornment, um, beauty, style, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I want, like this particular piece here, it's called God. Um, and, you know, it's a Mende, it's a figure wearing a, a Mende um, helmet and costume, but on the face of it is um, this sort of like uh, it's script. And I took that, I took the script, I took these letters and the text from a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat. And so for me, the use of these two things kind of bridge, <clears throat> excuse me, the a gap of time, the, a gap of culture, a uh, gap of identity, and kind of wrangles all of that stuff into like one body, into one moment. Um, and for me, I think most of the work kind of operates in that way. Like it's, it's an opportunity for me to kind of point toward, towards the things that I'm interested in and I, that I like and that I think are interesting and a way to, um, you know, create little like hiccups in how we look at the work. Like it, you know, you consume it and you have to stop for a second to say, what is that? And and that kind of thing. And that's one of the things I really enjoy doing. Um, again, uh, this piece is called, I need a vacation from this vacation. And I say again, because it's me also pointing uh, towards uh, another art artist. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, Aaron Douglas, um, artist from Harlem, making like these really beautiful large scale paintings. And, you know, as, a, as an artist kind of looking at this history of black artists who've worked in America and like, I don't know, I guess I'm just thinking right now, looking at this again, like I always like these works. And then I got to see one in person and realize like, how amazingly beautiful these paintings are and like how the colors actually kind of, I don't know, for me, they were like alive more than I think happens in like a digital image. Um, but in any event, um, I think about, you know, the figures in this image, um, you know, moving into bondage, this sort of trip, this travel, this destination across the seas, like, like all the things that are sort of packed into this, but also this notion of like this figure looking up, this figure looking at the cosmos, kind of thinking about, you know, being almost like forced to look up and think about the world that was larger than themselves, right? So for me, I wanted to like, you know, even like jump ahead, right? Like a person like, <laughs> still thinking about labor, right? Like like forced labor, like, and so this guy is saying, I need a vacation. Like, you know, you go on vacation because you've been working. And, and also like the kind of pun joke of, of, you know, the sort of like, I hate Mondays kind of riff on labor today, like, or, you know, labor as like a monotonous kind of rote, like um, experience the you know, the idea of cubicles and office buildings and like, you know, sedentary activities and a person going on vacation. Um, I don't know, I feel like that it, within that title is that world of, of work and labor in like the 20th and 21st century. And for me, that is really kind of, you know, in contrast to like the labor that these figures were moving into, right? These are people going into the middle passage, uh, moving across the waters to kind of, you know, 
be forced to labor for somebody else's economy. Um, so, I mean, and that's, that's I, I would say that's how my work often sort of functions uh, when you look at it. I will um, talk about the work, like for me, what was really early work to get a sense of how these things started. Um, I used to work on craft paper. We'll talk about materials, process, all of this stuff, um, if I can indulge you all. But so, I mean, I started making this work in grad school. Um, in undergrad, I was doing, you know, making paintings and slowly moving into this drawing practice. So then when I got to grad school, I really was able to kind of uh, carve out for myself, like, the thing that I wanted to do for a long time, which was start, you know, starting to make these like large scale figurative images. I wanted them to be big, to be grand, like almost larger than life. And that, you know, took a little bit of time to, to get to the scale that I, I wanted to work at. But I, you know, was working on this craft paper because one, it was cheap and accessible. You know, you use um, this kind of stuff in, you know, studio practices, but you don't all, you don't use this paper for your your final works and for me it was important to like i liked working out of this like get as much as i can out of like uh, a limited amount of materials but also i thought about like the work not being archival uh, again thinking about like time and like where is this drawing going to be in 100 years and the idea that in theory, these things are, you know, packed with materials that will, you know, make it brittle and potentially destroy it. So it kind of spoke to like, you know, ideas of ownership. Um, I was sort of obsessed with like, this is in grad school, nobody was buying my artwork, but <laughs> I was obsessed with like ideas of ownership and like who has the ability and the leisure to purchase this artwork that I'm making that is about the subject of a people who could not afford, you know, like the people who the work is about can't afford the work, right? Or can't like afford to participate in the world of art buying. And um, I mean, that's a broad way to say it because there are plenty of black collectors. But at that point I was thinking about how, you know, my thoughts in grad school about the art world as like this, thing out there that was part of this larger kind of um, white cultural system that, you know, kind of was about taking and, and just all this other stuff. Um, so it was exciting to kind of make a work that, I meant to keep going through these images, I was rambling, but it was exciting to make work that resisted that in some way. Um, but one of the things that happened, and I'll show you a bunch of these, but if you started to look at like the top edges of these things, um, Craft paper is really hard to keep around and it's unwieldy, it's fragile, even without it destroying itself. Um, and so I think a couple of things kind of like happened at the same time. I really got tired of like working with that paper um, and the meaning of it started to be less important to me. Like my, thoughts around, like, I, I guess I stopped privileging that world in the thing that I was making, right? Like, I'm making my work with particular ideas in mind, with particular audiences in mind. And I think my first job is to make the work and then like, you know, then start thinking about how to like, have it seen and or like how it will live and function over time. I really can't afford to like spend time thinking about like, you know, the art world. And I, I spend a lot of time actively trying not to think about the art world in a sense. It's just more of these. So um, in my shift from this, like, you can see this paper sags and, you know, I couldn't get it in like sizes that I need. So I was gluing papers together. Um, 
I had to start seeking out like other ways to kind of uh, make this work. One thing I didn't mention, and we'll go back to this image, was that the other function of the paper was like that it was a different color. It wasn't like white paper. So I was really functioning like functioning in like a um, I guess like a language based kind of consideration of race and identity. Like like even the idea of like blank whiteness as neutrality, right? I wanted to like kind of place, you know, this brown color as the neutral kind of ground on which I can build images of people on top of. So when I shifted out of that paper, I needed a way to kind of, you know, retrieve that color. Like I was very important to me. And I, you know, I tried, you know, just acrylic washes and I didn't like what that did to the texture of the paper. Um, I basically, I, I hit on this thing of, you know, dyeing it in tea. Um, this is not me, this is a guy that was like working with me at the time to help me do this stuff, John. Uh, but I, you know, we built this little thing and I would just dye my paper with like really cheap dollar store tea. Um, I don't have images of it in the water, but, and it would give me these kinds of colors, right? Um, it would give me, and you know, I was able to like, you know, create, like the longer I sat it in the in the dye bath, the, the darker it got. And so I could really play around with like a range of values. And so that was exciting. Um, sometimes it'd be really light, sometimes it'd be almost golden. Um, and then I, you know, from there was, you know, I moved on to uh, fabric dye. And this is done in a slightly different way that I'll talk about uh, in, a, in further into the talk, but I would also create dye bath with actual fabric dye and soak the paper in those and to get these kind of colors. These are done with washes and I started doing that later. Um, this is uh, called Archangel. I made this, I think around the time that uh, Eric Garner was murdered. It was, you know, during that period. And it's, um, for me, I think about it as an altar to like that spirit and that, that you know, like what happened to that man. Uh, so it's the kind of things, you know, like in my experience, the kind of things you would find at in altars and, but it's, a, you know, it's a bunch of, drones and cameras and, you know, also thinking about how we are filming these things. We're filming, being filmed and like the kind of, the outcome doesn't change. Um, yeah, anyway. So I'll talk about like how, you know, like the actual like day-to-day -day kind of studio practice. Um, so like I I started working on like you know you know very traditional archival art paper and um, I'm sorry I'm moving my text up um, yeah so first things first is I bring people into the studio this is my assistant Charlotte Thompson in the back we together she does a lot of this work but <laughs> I do I design some of these things. Um, we make a lot of costumes um, and it's all very like, you know, hands-on kind of, like I wouldn't call it, it we don't do like high-end fabrication stuff. Um, I need just enough to kind of get the thing across for me to make the drawing. Um, this particular image was not for a drawing. I don't want to draw all those buttons. That's a lot of time. Um, we were, I'm gonna make a, like a movement video. And then the the dancer who we modeled the costume for moved out of town because of the pandemic. So, you know, we got to readjust, but we'll figure it out. Um, hopefully this will become a drawing. We just did this the other day and I'm like super excited about <laughs> turning this into a drawing. Um, but yeah, Charlotte makes all this stuff. Uh, you know, we find models. Many, many of them are like 
she's been finding them. Before I moved to New York, I was doing um, large drawn friends of mine, or I had a small little group of models that I kind of worked with. Um, yeah, so we I bring people into the studio. Um, if there's really ornate or really kind of involved costume and we make it, that person wears it, I shoot them and um, we go from there. This is a, and I'm gonna show you walk through the whole process of one particular piece. Um, so I was I was up late. Anyway, I, won't, I wanted to do a drawing of this um, black devil figure. And um, so the model I chose actually did not have hair, but I wanted this devil to have a certain texture of hair. So we brought somebody in to give him a lace front. And, um, you know, I started thinking like, I don't, when you see the final drawing, like how necessary was this part of the process to happen? But I think it was necessary for me to like, make it like to see this thing, even though like, in the costume that he's wearing, it just barely peeks out. But I needed to see this like moment happen. Um, yeah, and so you can kind of see the texture of the hair that I was going for, and uh, you know, made some photographs, and you know, and we hung out, <laughs> and then we, you know, I from there I started making the drawing. Um, I didn't document this whole process. I should have, but. Um, in this case, like I did this like, you know, line drawing. I actually had my assistant fill in the flat red color. I had to go out of town, so I had her do that part. And then I come back in and start working on the value and then to the face and all of that. And, um, you know, I got to a point where I felt like, well, the drawing is pretty much finished, uh, but not, it doesn't really do anything for me yet. I think I was just obsessed with kind of drawing this person in costume. So, you know, I snapped a picture of it laying in bed. And I also, this is Mephisto from Marvel Comics. One of the kind of references I was thinking about trying to channel into this image amongst a bunch of other stuff. But I think this was in large part one of the things I was thinking about. So like, you know, I will like play him, you know, with a photo app in my phone and draw in ideas. And this is the one that kind of stuck. And so come back to the studio and make this thing. And it you know, I'm pretty happy with this. I, I am excited about, you know, the devil wearing a Jesus piece. Like that is the kind of um, tongue in cheek pun kind of thing that I enjoy doing. So, but that's, you know, kind of how like the step by step, but I also wanted to show you all like the actual like drawing process. And I'll talk through some of this. This thing is long and I'm not, we'll watch this like a minute or so. And I'll um, kind of talk about this particular piece. So that the first show, photo of the guy sitting, that's the the model for this particular piece. So sometimes a person is just wearing what they're wearing and I add things on top of that. Um, this is, again, I talked about dyeing the paper to get tea. I had to, um, obviously moving to New York, I really don't have like, space or facilities for that kind of like involved process of building a a bath that's this big. These drawings are seven feet by five feet. So I can't keep a thing like that around, I have nowhere to dump the water. It was just, and you know, I realized like, oh, I could get this same thing with just like washes of coffee. So really you saw earlier in this video, like it's just me pouring, I'll make a pot of coffee. In this case, I just, you know, ordered some Dunkin' coffee and put it in a rag and, cause I'm still kind of into this like color and this background as a type of sort of meaning for myself. Um, yeah, so that's where one, it's just easier. I can just kind of do it. It dries in a few minutes and I can get to work like really quickly. Um, yeah, so. And you see I'm where the image is on the computer screen and I just get to drawing. Um, and I'll skip ahead to some of this. Um, at this point, I'm thinking about, you know, I knew, I, the only thing that I knew that I wanted this figure to have a large like head piece. Um, 
And the first thing that I was thinking about, I kind of had some like second thoughts on. So it it moved and changed into like a bunch of different things. But um, I'll zoom through some of this. It's just drawing. You all art majors, you've you've done drawings. I'm trying to get to this one. So, oh, it's the drawing that's behind me. Yeah, I forgot that that's, yeah. Um, I decided, I was looking at a, a, a painting by um, John Biggers, which I did not include in the PowerPoint. I don't know why I did that. But it's a, a painting of his called Starry Crown. And it's got all of these uh, really extreme like angles in it. And, um, and it's full of patterns and, um, I wanted to like take kind of the substance of that painting and turn it into like a crown for this person, but almost like an absurd crown. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like a view into like the time and how long it takes to kind of do these things. And, you know, I can get a little further back and kind of see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, go back to the PowerPoint. So you can see that turns into this. Um, it's still not quite done, um, but that's what that thing turned into. So you can kind of, you know, see the whole process. All right. Uh, one of the other things I, I mentioned earlier was that like my love of comics really informing what I do. And uh, one of the like, almost like literal comics that I'm kind of working out of is uh, the Marvel handbook, uh, the handbook to the Marvel universe, which is basically an encyclopedia. I don't even know if they still make this thing, but it was around when I was younger and reading comics and really stayed with me and, a lot, and it really kind of fed into like how I like to like consume things. Like I want all the information like right there, easily accessible. So like, you know, I couldn't like, there was no way I could afford to really collect the range of comics coming out of Marvel Comics, even though I was obsessed with like all of it. Um, this thing really helped me like I was reading Spider-Man, X-Men, Fantastic Four. That means there's the Avengers and Daredevil, all these other things that I basically I had no money to like go and buy. Anyway, I love this book because it allowed me to kind of get the histories of these things that I didn't know about. And I, you know, and I, I love the idea of just this figure on the stark background. You know, it's very much like <laughs> a type of ethnography. And I think some of that is, you know, evident in my own work. And I know that's like a, you know, thing to kind of contend with. But I like using, at least in some way, the notion of that as a thing to kind of manipulate, like the idea of t making an image of someone as a type of catalog of categories and um, so I just keep going. Um, but what happens when the person in that image is forming that image, right? Like, so I, I, for me, I feel like the characters and the drawings that I make are aware of what's happening. Um, I don't know why I have so many of these. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to kind of show like, this is where this kind of composition comes from, this sort of singular figure uh, in a kind of void space, it's a way to kind of get a sense of the characters from a world, right? And I guess it's just the world in my mind, the kind of like, you know, world of like a liberated black populace that exists in, you know, my imagination and hopefully like real life someday. Um, but I, and yeah. And so, you know, I do do images sometimes that really lean into the world of like superheroes and comics. This particular image, um, 
that a woman, if you guys have ever watched Good Times, and if you watched Good Times obsessively up until the last season and the last episode, um, one of the things he does is um, starts making his own comics and like Dino Woman is a character he made. Um, <laughs> and the thing that, so one of the things I do in my work is I try to point towards uh, a canon of black artists who have come before me, right? So, you know, I'll include references to Charles White, you saw Basquiat, Aaron Douglas, and just a range of, you know, artists. Um, but in this case, you know, JJ is a fictional artist, but the person who made those paintings was a real artist. Uh, Ernie Barnes is a black artist working in this period and was hired to make the paintings that would be on the television show. So for me, it was a way to also point towards like this dual thing of like the actual person and then this sort of fictional space. Um, and I, I'll try to get into some of that later as well. Um, I, I, I guess I'm thinking about um, like how comics function as a fictional world to wrestle with ideas, right? Any kind of fiction, right? Any kind of like, you know, notion of television movies, a way for us to process things. And for me, comics uh, were the way that I was introduced to like really big, grand existential ideas. Um, and so the, the idea of like, the fictional world being present in an almost real way. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to say that. Um, yeah. So I'll talk about, I'm, I'll try to come back to that thought when I can say it a bit more clear, clearly, but I'll talk now about a few, what for me were like experimental pieces. Um, this is a drawing I've been wanting to do for years. Um, I just didn't have the, sort of, I guess it's the confidence to like just rip off Marvel Comics in this way. It's based on um, what most people know as like Venom's costume. And it's still strange when people say that because I think of it as Spider-Man's black costume, but that's just me showing my age and still just being obsessed with like a particular time period. Um, but it's that black costume. And this kind of like inky black gooey substance, I really, wanted to like pull that into my own practice um, and like like start here and then stretch it to here, right? So this is um, the uh, logo for the Black Panther Party, but sort of like um, exaggerated and abstracted in a similar way to that black suit. And uh, I think of these three pieces together, right? Like they all kind of exist um, this like, black, inky, void, all-consuming kind of blackness. And I don't know how to exactly describe the feeling of, the feeling that pushed me to like, want to make these images in that, in a way that, in a way that I feel like I'm describing them. Um, other than like, I just wanted them to be like super like dark and black in part because I'm also thinking about like the act of drawing, like this thing of, again, like creating three dimensionality on a piece of like two dimensional paper. Like, and I keep going back to comics, right? Like this, this thing of like reading characters that are just ink on a page, but them feeling like larger than life in your mind. I think that's the thing I'm hoping to do with my artwork, like to create like 3D, 4D from like a really simple structure of, you know, Conte and charcoal on paper. Um, so this, yeah, I wanted to play around with the notion of like, the blackness of like the materials I'm drawing with. Like instead of just lines and like rendered recognizable, recognizable representational drawing, like just the sort of compositional nature of it. Um, like what drawing can do. And, you know, 
this drawing came before all of those, but I think it actually does the thing I was looking for um, more efficiently. Uh, this piece is called Rearview Mirror because I don't think I have a, a name on it. Um, and if you look towards just off center of this image, there's a tiny little white dot. And the idea is that you are looking at the planet Earth um, from space as if you're leaving, which is why it's called Rearview Mirror. Um, and so when I exhibit this piece, it is exhibited with music that uh, I worked with uh, a musician friend of mine, Jawad. He um, is an MC and an experimental jazz musician. And we created this, um, he created, like I gave him some ideas about what I was looking for, but he created this like soundscape. And for me, all I really wanted was for the person to be able to like, look at this image and with the music, like the, the music as a device to make them get lost in this black space. Um, and I think if the person is willing, it really functions. Like it really kind of um, happens that way. Um, in a very similar fashion, this is a drawing called Meteorite. Um, uh, someone gave me a book, um, Ray Bradbury's The Illustrated, Ma Illustrated Man. And one of the stories in a kaleidoscope um, was about a group of astronauts who have an accident in space and I think there's an explosion and they're all drifting away from each other into space. And the story is about the conversation that they're having with each other while their comm systems still function. At some point it stops functioning, but like, you know, as they face like death in the depths of space. Um, and one of them kind of um, falls to earth or, or, or is anticipating falling to earth and burning up in the sky and being seen as a meteorite. And hopefully at least his life will have some meaning in that way, in that someone could look up and see this bright light and uh, find meaning in that. Um, but so for me, I wanted to, I was, I was always really obsessed with like the conversation of that moment uh, or the potential for the conversation in that moment. And um, I'm, I'm gonna finish this thought, but I see it's 9.15. We might be like running out of time a little bit because I want to do Q and A. But so the idea is that um, she has this walkie talkie and I think what I really wanted was like, if you could hear this drawing speak. So I paired it with the actual walkie talkie. So when you walk into, if it's exhibited somewhere, you see both of these things together. And um, I had the model who posed for that drawing record a text that I wrote that sort of outlined these ideas of like isolation and loneliness and you know, seeking and like questioning. Um, and so you can, for me, I, I'm hoping that it works in that way that you can like see this drawing and feel like you're hearing that figure speak. So like she has in the drawing one walkie talkie and then the other one exists in real life. Um, this piece was fun to make. I wanna say one thing about it and then I'll zoom through a bunch of images so we can do Q and A. Um, the label here says McDowell Instruments, and that's the same on the walkie talk here. I was really trying to do some like meta kind of, you know, so if you, you know, the recently the Coming to America version part two came out. Um, I made this like two years ago, but you know, there's a running gag in that movie, both the first part and the second of uh, the, the, father of Eddie Murphy's wife has a restaurant that basically rips off McDonald's and he calls it McDowell's, which is his last name. And so McDonald's Instruments also makes all this kind of technology stuff. So I I figured that in that world that that also would have a McDowell name, like a McDowell, like a black version of this technology, um, just like there's a black version of that McDonald's. Um, that stuff really cracks me up to make. I think I like being able to laugh when I think about my own work. Um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna zoom through a few more images. This is um, called sarcophagus, all gold leaf. My assistant did a lot of that. This piece is called reincarnation. Um, I think I'm also thinking, I, I didn't make this connection until tonight putting this thing together, this PowerPoint, uh, with the archangel drawing, like the kind of altar piece, uh, thinking about life and death in a sense. Um, like this thing has jewelry on it. Like it's a, I'm thinking about if a person was reincarnated as a plant. Yeah. And um, I didn't mean to go so fast. Yeah. And this is all, you know, fairly recent work. This piece I could talk about all day long. And it's a drawing of, of my wife, who's a performance artist. She's holding a grenade in her hands. And I'll end on these last two pieces. I talked about drawing the whole time, but I'm actually starting to incorporate paint into the actual drawings. Um, I was thinking about how when I'm preparing my, when I'm planning my drawings, I don't make a lot of sketches, but I will sort of play around in Photoshop um, and juxtapose things on top of each other. And if you've worked with Photoshop, even just in the rudimentary way that I work with it, like just the notion of layering and like putting things on top of another, things that clearly come from different world, like different senses, like with different light sources and all of that. Um, the space between them feels really strange sometimes. And I'm really hoping that I can kind of play around with that in the drawing a little bit, like that these things feel like they're floating on top of this world. Um, but we'll see, I've only done it a couple of times, you know. Yeah, and I'll, I'll end with this piece, just um, just some other stuff, but I don't think I have time to get to them. Yeah, how do I get out of that? And um, yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, and I hope we have some questions or, you know, yeah, thank you so much, Robert. That was wonderful. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to show up in the chat, um, I just wanted to ask you maybe about your use of the color red. I noticed a lot of the figures were wearing red. Yeah. Um, it's kind of twofold. Like um, I, I, work in, I work, you know, with Conte and which comes in like very, very limited range of colors. Um, and so, I mean, there's obviously pastels and things I can kind of get the wide range, but at, I think maybe in 2013, 14, maybe, I really wanted to, um, basically I reduced my palette to just the colors that came in the Conte range. One, I just wanted to limit like, uh, you know, the thing where like, I'm only gonna wear like one outfit, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna limit my choices so that I'm freed up to do kind of other things. I felt like I needed to like really reduce the number of things that I was doing in the work so that I could kind of concentrate on like the craftsmanship of the drawing, the uh, types of materials that I was like juxtaposing things with. So I, I used to use a lot of African objects in the work, um, headdresses, costuming, and for me, those things pointed towards like a black culture, history, spirituality, civilization, right? That um, I could use sort of to to ground the world that I'm that I'm making up. I could ground it in that. But I started realizing, like, you know, I come from a culture also, and I started thinking about 
like what are the things that I'm not using from like my own like very specific sort of black Southern, uh, in some ways, like I grew up like in a Baptist church and like all the kind of like religious rituals that came with that. Like I wanted to like exchange anyway, I needed to like shift and work from that space, which was a much harder space to work from because there isn't the like plethora of material objects. Like black people in America didn't make headdresses, didn't make you know, ritual costumes in a way that like African culture is like littered with. So in order for me to kind of really think about meaning and and that kind of stuff, I needed less stuff to think about so that I could kind of focus. Um, and so the red becomes a color that is like the opportunity to bring in a, a, like a level of like dynamism, like it becomes really dynamic in the images, it pops, you know, so compositionally it's a way for me to like, you know, inject a little bit of life into it. And so similarly, like, because I don't know if I said this in the talk, but like one of the things I was doing was like working out of, when I shifted from these African objects to these other kinds of um, references, the, the most specific reference was like my religious upbringing, which was like, that was kind of the, the, Along with comics, like this was the place where I sort of was introduced to a, no to a notion of existentialism, of things that are larger than myself. Um, and so what comes with that is like, uh, like this notion of blood and life and vitality. And so oftentimes the red is meant to kind of evoke that in a sense. Um, so I don't know, it's, it, it became the one color that I could count on and keep in my kind of stable of, of materials and ideas and yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one person, Ali says, um, one, loved this talk and seeing your process. Two, could you talk about the space launch and the impetus for that? Oh, I can show, can I show images of that? I still have my thing up, right? That's the thing that I didn't get to. I'll, I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, so uh, what year was this? I don't even know what year, this was like three or four years ago. I was invited by the Crystal Bridges Museum to, I was in an exhibition and then uh, sort of alongside that exhibition, they had the opportunity to kind of send an art object. Uh, we say space, but it's near space, like using a weather balloon to kind of take this thing up. Um, and asked me if I wanted to do it. And I was like, yes, like that was super exciting to me. Um, so beyond just sending this thing up, I felt like I wanted to like, almost like memorialize the moment. So I kind of created a cult. We didn't have a name, but it was an opportunity to make costumes. Um, again, my assistant <laughs> made these costumes uh, and I invited uh, a couple friends of mine to be the cult members. Um, and the guy on the right with the turban is the head of the cult. It's Maurice Duhon. He's a really interesting person. He's done all kinds of stuff, but he was also an actor. And like he performed um, basically the kind of like sermon to send this thing off. This is the sculpture. It's actually here. I don't want to turn my computer, but we sent it up. And I, it's, a, um, it's an object. It's an African object that I covered in aluminum. It has a briefcase. Um, inside that briefcase, I at one point uh, a few years ago, myself and a friend, we went and visited the gravesite of Sun Ra, the jazz musician, and I took some of the dirt from his grave. And like my plan was like, oh, one day I'll buy a house and like I'll make a garden and use this this sort of dirt from Sun Ra's grave as like the founding thing in my garden. And uh, but it. I don't have a garden. So I've just, I've been carrying this dirt around for like 10 years, I think. So I put a little bit of that in the briefcase to kind of, you know, take a little piece of Sun Ra into space. Um, this is the object in its kind of cradle. And this is the day of the event. 
And um, Maurice was in character the whole day, talking to people. You know, he created a series of rituals for us and he gave the sermon, um, had the crowd sort of participate in, in the actions and the gestures of the sermon. And um, this is it floating up. Let's watch it go away. And this is the photo we were able to kind of get of the image sort of floating right there on that, um, you know, right at that space in between, you know. And um, then we kind of just played around <laughs> until it came back down. They had to go and um, um, re like retrieve it from, I'm gonna come back to the thing. They had to go and retrieve it. It went, it landed like 30, 40 miles away on somebody's yard. And, you know, this is in Arkansas. And so I did not go with them traipsing on somebody's private land, but they found it. And the man's land that it landed on, his last name was Pruitt, which is crazy. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that was a project and it was really fun. And like one of the favorite things I've done as an artist. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, Marina says, thank you for sharing the studio process images. Really cool to see how the drawings come together. And then asks, um, what is your favorite sci-fi show right now and why? Ooh, that's a hard question. My favorite sci-fi show. Right now, what am I watching? The only thing I'm watching right now is I'm finishing up Attack on Titan, which I don't know if we would call that science fiction, but I feel like it's amazing. Like, I don't read manga, so I don't really know the history of that as a manga, but like this world that they've constructed is so like, it's both close to our real world and it's like, weird history of war and like um, meanness and, and the crushing of like people, of like groups of people, but also it's super wacky and wild. Um, yeah, I'm, I will always like love Star Trek. I watch a lot of Star Trek and um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm with like literally watching Attack on Titan before the talk, so. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, and this might be our last question of the night. Um, Jordan wants to know, um, they say, I noticed many of your figures are alone and isolated. Could you speak more to this? Yeah, I think, I think, I don't think of them as alone and isolated. I think of them, I think it is like me capturing a moment of that figure's world. Um, and I think this is why I mentioned like that, the the notion of like ethnography, like, this thing we're seeing is not the whole of this character's world. It is the sort of like peek into that universe, right? And it's the it's it's the opportunity we have to kind of get a glimpse of a microsecond of one figure. Um, yeah, I do think about isolation and aloneness a lot. I there's a text that I use a lot um, called A Stranger in the Village by James Baldwin. And he, where he is, he moves to a small town in Switzerland to write. And he's the only black person there. I think he may have been the only black person to have ever visited that place in, at that point. This would have been, I think in the sixties at some point. Um, and he taught basically, I don't know, I, I guess he talks about like the notion of the aloneness of the moment. And I don't know how to describe the the aloneness of that moment and its connection to like, like the notion of like projecting things about people. Like these people love him in that town because he's a curiosity. Like they wanna to touch his hair, they treat him very well, but they also like, um, their church does a thing every year where they give money to poor Africans, but it's such of a, it's sort of an absurd um, event that they hold. And I think there's a little bit of like, 
uh, dressing up and like, you know, like, like there's this idea that they, this larger idea that they have about the primitiveness of Africans and black people as a race contrasted against him as an actual person and their curiosity about him. And like that sort of like, although he's there surrounded by all of these people who treat him very nicely, it's really compounded by the loneliness of knowing that he can't ever really connect with those people. And so I guess maybe in some ways, like these drawings mimic some of that, like that's that world. And that's a world that is like fictional in the future, in my imagination. And it's a liberated sort of um, utopic kind of space that does not exist right now. Um, and I think there is a little bit of like loneliness in the idea of constantly having to like, you know, live under the kind of heel of somebody else's ideas about the world and identity and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of rambling, but I don't know if I think about loneliness when I'm composing the work in that way. It doesn't feel that way to me. But I think there may be some of that kind of embedded in like the space that I'm working out of, I guess. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm sure if there were more folks here, you would hear a lot of applause and thank yous. <laughs> um, but we really appreciate you sharing with us um, and taking the time out tonight. Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing the class and doing the studio visits tomorrow. So thanks. Been great. <laughs>